We hope you enjoy the following video presentation sponsored by the C.S. Lewis Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization with a mission to equip and encourage Christians to live their faith within the world of ideas and arts. To help us continue to host events and make videos like this one, please make a donation after viewing the video by going to www.cslewis.org or clicking the link below. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for those generous and humbling words. And thank the Foundation for the honor of being invited to give this first plenary address on, to be sure that I get it right, faith, freedom, and the public square. The sound is okay? <clears throat> I've tried in this opening talk to <laughs> sort of cover the ground of the topic without being too abstract. Um, we'll see whether I've come anywhere close to uh, succeeding in that attempt. So let me begin the, this opening address of the conference by reminding you of how the prospectus for the conference explains the theme of faith, freedom, and the public square. Let me quote, because I think it's a good statement. In recent years, much of the discourse within the public square has, been, has become strained as differing visions of justice and freedom <clears throat> have come into direct conflict over issues of public policy. In order, however, for discourse in the public square to be meaningful and mutually beneficial, all parties must own the responsibility to honestly extend to one another the courtesy of both listening as well as mutually responding to conflicting perspectives and worldviews. Now, the mainstream American university is, of course, a leading element in the conversation within the public square. Sadly, however, over the past half century or so, still reading from the prospectus, there has em emerged an increasing tendency to trivialize and stigmatize all things religious as being anti-intellectual, inherently discriminatory, merely personal, and therefore unworthy of serious consideration within the academy, and consequently, more broadly, in the public square. That's the prospectus for our conference. I judge that the prospectus is correct in suggesting that over the past half century or so, there has in fact been a tendency to silence the religious voice in the university while at the same time encouraging other minority voices, such as that of women, gays, and people of color. There are let me note that there are some significant exceptions, however, in the case of my field, philosophy. Over the past half century, there has been a truly amazing flourishing of philosophy of religion in our country, and more particularly of Christian philosophy, so that the Society of Christian Philosophers now has some 900 members in this country and is easily the largest affiliate of the main philosophical association, the American Philosophical Association. <clears throat> and I think that's terrific. And if one were giving, trying to give a comprehensive picture of the situation, you'd have to include that, plus the Society of Christian Historians and so forth. Nonetheless, I think the generalization is pretty much correct that the prospectus gives. The reasons the prospectus mentions for the silencing of the religious voice is that religion is charged with being anti-intellectual, with being inherently discriminatory, and with being merely private and personal. I myself would add to those three charges the charge that religion has inherent tendencies towards violence. I think in some quarters that's probably the main charge, actually. Now let me say at the beginning that you and I here must face the fact that these charges are not entirely baseless. Some versions of religion, including some versions of Christianity, are indeed anti-intellectual. Some are invidiously discriminatory. <clears throat> Some are private and merely personal. 
and some do encourage violence, need I tell you. On the other hand, it's patently false to claim that this is true of religion in general, or to suggest that these vices are unique to religion. But rather than developing those points further, important as I think they are, what I'd like to do to begin my talk this evening is to present to you an argument for silencing the religious voice in the university that I regard as much more powerful than any of those that I've just mentioned, that I think you and I have to face up to. It's an argument that comes from the great turn of the last century German sociologist Max Weber. Weber did not think that religion in general was inherently anti-intellectual, invidiously discriminatory or violent. Nevertheless, he argued passionately that the religious voice must be excluded from the university. The very nature of the university in the modern world, said Weber, requires its exclusion. So what I'd like to do is present as briefly as possible, but also as powerfully as I can, Weber's argument. As I say, I think it's an argument that you and I have to take seriously, and that gets us deep into the substance of things. In 1918, two years before his death, Max Weber delivered a famous lecture at the University of Munich titled in German, Wissenschaft als Beruf. The standard English translation of that German is science as a vocation. That's a seriously misleading translation. It's misleading for this reason. Our English word science, for most people, connotes natural science, or possibly for a few people, natural science plus social science. The German word Wissenschaft does not have those connotations. So I think a better translation would be academic learning, academic learning as vocation. And in Weber's use of the German Beruf, and in the English vocation, we have to hear distinct echoes of the religious idea of a calling, a beruf, a vocation. Academic learning, you should have a handout. I'm going to give some, use some fairly extended quotes from Weber, and I thought it best for you to have them in hand. Academic learning today is a vocation, said Weber, and he meant that a calling, a beruf. Academic learning today is a vocation, organized in special disciplines in the service of knowledge of interrelated facts. That's a fairly bland sounding comment, but what Weber is doing is making the polemical point that questions of meaning, worth, and value do not belong within the university. Let me say it again. That questions of meaning, worth, and value do not belong within the university. Let's continue reading. The duty of an academic teacher is that he, she, is that he have the intellectual integrity to see to it that it is one thing to state facts, to determine mathematical or logical relations or the internal structure of cultural values, while it is another thing to answer questions of the value of culture and its individual contents and the question of how one should act in the cultural community and in political associations. These are quite heterogeneous, distinct problems. If a professor asks why he should not deal with both types of problems in the lecture room, facts and values, the answer is because the prophet and the demagogue do not belong on the academic platform. I am ready to prove from the works of our historians that whenever the man of science introduces his personal value judgment, a full understanding of the facts ceases. In short, said Weber, academic learning is not some gift of grace of seers and prophets dispensing sacred meaning, values and relations, nor does it partake of the contemplation of sages and philosophers about the meaning of the universe and of things to which Weber then adds these portentous words, this is the inescapable condition of our historical situation. We cannot evade it so long as we remain true to ourselves as academics. 
The images of fate and of submission to fate run throughout Weber's entire lecture. Engaging in academic learning in the modern world, he says, requires submitting to a certain fate. And to my ear, whenever Weber has that fate in mind and the necessity of submission to it, his rhetoric acquires unmistakable tones of melancholy. And that melancholy, that tone of melancholy in his rhetoric has everything to do with his conviction that fate has decreed that the religious voice, or more precisely, the religious prophetic voice characteristic of Judaism and Western Christianity, fate has decreed that that religious voice has no place in the modern academy. Weber's melancholy concerning the exclusion of the religious voice from the modern academy was a component in his far more comprehensive, what I'm going to call melancholy of modernity. And to understand that more comprehensive melancholy and exactly what Weber is saying about the university, we've got to dip our toes, no more than that, just the tips of our toes into Weber's theory of modernization. I think easily the most influential theory of modernization, modernization around. Here's Weber's thought. The essence of modernization, leaving a traditional society behind and becoming a modernized society, consists in the emergence of distinct spheres of activity, each with its own internal values and laws. For example, the capitalist economy, the bureaucratic state, impersonal law, academic learning, the art world, the world of recreation, you can carry on by yourself. Weber's thought was that in the modern world, the economy, for example, comes into its own, liberated from the dictates of princes, bishops, and politicians, and freed to follow its own internal laws and values. And so to the academy comes into its own, freed from people on the outside, princes, bishops, politicians, whoever, telling people in the academy what it's supposed to do, comes into its own to follow its own internal dynamics and values and laws and so forth. He describes these spheres as autonomous, self-normed. And he called this, as many of you know, this, this whole process of the emergency, emergence of distinct spheres, differentiation. And I think everybody in this audience feels at once, if you got <laughs> aware of our present society and some cultural memory of, of how it once was, that there's a lot of truth in this, the emergence of distinct spheres. Now then he went on to say that though the emergence of a distinct sphere of activity represents liberation from outside influences and liberation for activity within that sphere, he also noted that those who work within that sphere have now no choice but to conform to its internal laws and dynamics and values. From their standpoint, it looks like anything but liberation. If one is a businessman operating within the modern differentiated economy, one has, said Weber, no choice but to let the sanctity of contracts and the bottom line govern one's decisions. Those who act other, otherwise by allowing their religious convictions to shape their business practices soon find themselves going bankrupt. Good people come in last. And so too a professor in the modern economy, academy has no choice but to submit to the canons of his guild, his or her guild. Those who allow their religious convictions to intrude into their teaching and research find themselves either denied tenure or treated as a pariah. Every now and then one hears somebody who proposes, hears of someone proposing to establish an alternative business in which it's not the bottom line that's determin determinative, but the flourishing of the employees at work and the provision of genuinely worthwhile products and services to the public. And so too, every now and then, one hears of somebody proposing to set up an academy, an alternative academy, 
in which the participants pursue wisdom and debate the meaning of things. All such brief experiments, as Weber, have their brief day and cease to be. The modern economy, the modern academy, proceed on their unalterable course. Once upon a time, says Weber, before the onset of modernization, things were different in the Christian West, at least. Once upon a time, everybody could, and some people did, shape their lives as a whole in accord with their religious convictions. Weber always presented himself as a religious skeptic, and I have no doubt that actually he was that. But I think you have to say intellectually, not emotionally. For what contributed to what I call Weber's melancholy of modernity, in fact, the main source of it, I think, was not only his conviction that we in the modern world have no choice but to conform to the laws and dynamics of our spheres in which we find ourselves. What also contributed to his melancholy was the fact that in the course of his vast historical research into the history of religion, he clearly found himself identifying emotionally with those medieval monks and nuns and those early Protestant lay people who struggled to conform their lives as a whole to the call that they heard coming from God. Modernity, says Weber, has made such lives impossible. Hence his melancholy. I quote, the ultimate and most sublime values have retreated from public life, either into the transcendental realm of mystical life or into the ethical brotherliness of direct and personal human relations. I would guess that some of you are acquainted with the haunting image, haunting passage of, <laughs> I would call it icy melancholy, that comes near the end of Weber's famous book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, where Weber says this. Oh, the Puritan Richard Baxter had said that uh, has preached that concern for material goods should be like a light cloak that you can coat that you can throw off at any time. Cannon should throw off at any time. Here's Weber. Fate has decreed that the care for external goods that the Puritan Richard Baxter said should be worn by the saint like a light cloak to be thrown aside at any moment has in fact become an iron cage and will remain an iron cage until the last ton of fossilized coal is burnt. And to that, he immediately adds bitingly these words. Those who think that the modern capitalist economy represents a level of civilization never before achieved are nullities, nobodies, specialists without spirit and sensualists without heart. Um, icy melancholy? An equally melancholy passage occurs in the essay that I mentioned at the beginning, Science as a Vocation. It's on your sheets there. To the person who cannot bear the fate of the times like a man, a human being, a man, one must say, he's talking about the academy now, the university, to the person who cannot bear the fate of the times like a man, one must say, may he return silently without the usual publicity buildup. The arms of the old churches are opened widely and compassionately for him. After all, they don't make it hard for him. It's true that one way or another he has to bring in his intellectual sacrifice, that's inevitable. But if he can really do that, we shall not rebuke him. For an intellectual sacrifice in favor of an unconditional religious devotion is ethically quite a different matter than the evasion of the plain duty of intellectual integrity, which sets in if one remains in the academy, but there offers feeble relative value judgments. In my eyes, such leaving of the academy and religious return stands higher than academic prophecy in the academy, which does not clearly recognize that in the lecture rooms of the university, 
No other virtue holds but plain intellectual integrity. So we shall set to work and meet the demands of the day in human relations as well as in our vocation. To summarize, the demands of the day in the university are the rules and standards of the guild. Those who bridle at those rules and standards because it makes it, they make it impossible for them to give expression to their religious identity and their teaching and research, they should leave the academy and make the intellectual sacrifice of returning to Mother Church. That return is not manly, but there is a certain honesty about it. Those are the two choices, says Weber. Submit to the rules of the modern academy and silence your religious voice, or leave the academy and return to Mother Church. Weber never explains in any detail what he takes the demands of the day in the university to be. But I think it becomes fairly clear how he was thinking. His declaration that in the university we are to confine ourselves to discovering facts and their relationships is, I take it, the clue. So let me express what I think is Weber's idea of what fate has decreed must occur in the contemporary academy university. Here's the idea, I think. We human beings have faculties, abilities. We human beings have faculties which when functioning properly and properly employed, put us in touch with facts and form in us beliefs whose content corresponds to the facts. The faculty of perception puts us in touch with the facts of the physical world. The faculty of introspection puts us in touch with the uh, facts of the self, interior consciousness. What you might call rational intuition puts you in touch with numbers and their relationships and logical relationships and so forth. Now, in everyday life, we allow the employment of these faculties to be shaped by our values, by our political convictions, by the traditions into which we've been inducted, by our religion, you name it, prejudices of various sorts, with the result that our everyday beliefs are a, are a thick mixture of true and false, entitled and unentitled, and with the result, we all know it, that we've got profound disagreements with each other. But here's the idea of the modern academy. Each, is, each participant is, as it were, to put in cold storage their everyday beliefs, and together to employ as reliably as possible our shared human faculties for putting us in touch with the facts and forming in us beliefs corresponding to the facts. And when we've done that, then we form theories and hypotheses that we test by further awareness of facts. When we fall short of this ideal in the academy, as we often do, participants, it's the responsibility of our fellow participants to point out where we fall short, to point out facts that we've overlooked, hasty generalizations, and fallacies in reasoning and so forth. So we correct each other moving towards consensus, never quite attaining it, but doing our best to move towards it. Academic learning, still saying what I think Weber thinks, is in that way a joint human project. It's not a Christian project. It's not a secular humanist project. It's not a naturalist project. It's a generically human project. We put in cold storage all our ordinary dissenting beliefs, and together we get at the facts and their relationships. That's the goal of the university, getting at the facts and their relationships. And what about religion? Well, religion is a matter of faith. People don't arrive at their religion by employing their shared human faculties as reliably as possible to get at the facts. That's why the religious voice has no place in the modern academy. It's just something else. 
That's how Weber was thinking. You see, his argument does not depend on false prejudicial claims about religion. It's rather a component of his theory of modernization, a widely accepted theory. Modernization consists of the emergence of distinct spheres of activity. Activity in each of these spheres is guided by the distinct values of that sphere. So is the economy. Religion is squeezed out of all of them. Out of business, the business world, out of the art world, out of politics, out of the whatever bureaucrats do, and so forth. <laughs> so what do you think? I think it's a really powerful argument, especially powerful because it, it, because one has the feel that, I, I've always got the feel when reading Weber, he's got a finger on a lot of what's really true and insightful and important, and it doesn't trade on, on prejudicial claims about religion. It's a really powerful argument. And my guess is that it expresses the implicit thinking of lots of people. Maybe fewer today than in Weber's day, but of lots of people. So it's a powerful argument. But is it compelling? Did Weber get things right? When he said that in the very nature of modernization, the religious voice is squeezed out of the university. I wouldn't have taken you this far down this road if I were not going to say at this point, I think he didn't get it right. I think the business of differentiation is by and large true, though I think if you actually look at these spheres, they tend to be far more influenced by outside factors than, than Weber does. I mean, it's silly to say that the art world is influenced only by internal artistic uh, spheres. Art, artists try to sell things, uh, sell their paintings and so forth. But I think it's by and large true. I think Weber's mistake was to mischaracterize academic learning, what goes on in the university. I simply don't think it's just a matter of drinking in facts and then po postulating theories about how they're related to each other. <laughs> so let me explain how much time. Did you notice when I was quoting passages from Weber that his understanding of the academic enterprise was shaped by, the di by his dichotomy of facts and values? Shapes all his thinking. Let me quote again two of his sentences early on, the, on your handout. One can only demand of the teacher that he have the intellectual integrity to see that it is one thing to state facts, to determine mathematical or logical relations of the internal structure of cultural values, while it is another thing to answer questions of the value of culture and its individual contents, and the question of how one should act in the cultural community and in political associations. And then, <laughs> I am ready to prove, he says, I am ready to prove from the works of our historians, he doesn't name them, that whenever the man of science introduces his personal value judgment, a full understanding of the facts ceases. Now I think that what's crucially missing from thinking in terms of that fact-value dichotomy is this. We human beings are interpreters. We do not just drink in the facts and form beliefs about the facts. We interpret what we hear, what we see, what we read. We make judgments about the significance of those facts. With the result that we form quite different beliefs, that two of us may read, may read, look at the same things, the same newspaper, but form quite different beliefs. We have different interpretations. What one person re interprets as the nefarious spread of libertarianism in modern America, and another person says, oh no, that's just the recognition of liberty and so forth. We read the same newspapers, listen to the same TV programs, but we interpret differently. So we are interpreting creatures. We are hermeneutic creatures. We cannot help but be such. And in addition to being interpreting creatures, we are also what I'm going to call, I'm going to invent a word, more or less invent a word, we are valorizing creatures. That is, we ascribe value, worth to things, to works of art, to mountain scenes, to meetings such as this, um, you name it, experiences in our lives. 
to worship. Here's my thesis. Interpretation and valorization are intrinsic to human nature. To interpret and to ascribe value and disvalue is what, part of what it is to be human. And because they're intrinsic to human nature, we cannot and do not just set them aside when we enter the halls of the university. Scholarship, scholarship is laced through with interpretation and valorization. It couldn't exist without it. Contemporary physics is an interpretation of reality, physical reality, not just a reading off. And look, how could one possibly operate in the university without making value judgments about better and worse scholarship, better and worse physics, better and worse poems, better and worse student papers, and so forth. Some of our interpretations and valorizations are shared by all human beings. Many obviously are not. In fact, I'm inclined to think that it can safely be said if, if you take the totality of a given person's interpretations of reality and what they value, their valorizations, if you take that particular totality, I think it's probably unique to that person. Nobody else values in exactly the same way, interprets in exactly the same way. It's an essential component of our identity, of our achieved identity. It's not something we can shuck off. And now for religion. A person's religion is a component of her interpreting and valorizing identity. For some, it's the most fundamental and comprehensive component. For others, it's less comprehensive. But always, what else is a religion but a way of interpreting and valuing certain things? It's inherently that. That's not, that's not all it is, but it's at least that. And so too, of course, are certain philosophical positions like naturalism. So here's my suggestion. When we engage in our particular academic disciplines, we engage as who we are, a person with a particular interpreting and valorizing identity, a certain way of understanding, attaching significance, valuing. We can do no other. We cannot shuck off our identities. I engage in my field of philosophy as someone whose embrace of Christianity is a deep and comprehensive component of my interpreting and valorizing identity. I cannot place it in cold storage. I wouldn't know what it was to do that. I cannot engage in philosophy as a generic human being. I can only do so as a Christian. Of course, I don't do so only as a Christian. I also do so as a member of Western civilization, as somebody who prizes liberal democracy, and so forth. And the counterpart thing holds for those philosophers whose embrace of naturalism is deep and comprehensive, and those whose embrace of secular humanism is deep and comprehensive. So here's my picture. Together, the naturalist and I engage in philosophy. Sometimes those of us who are Christian philosophers address our fellow Christian philosophers, and sometimes those who are naturalist philosophers address their fellow naturalist philosophers, but we also address each other. Philosophy, like chemistry, like sociology, philosophy is a shared human practice. And when we engage together in that practice, we don't, give just, we don't just give speeches declaring, here I stand, I can do no other. When we do it properly, we engage in dialogue. I listen to my fellow philosophers, listen to learn from them, listen to find out whether perhaps they've got some weighty objections to something that I believe deeply or something that I don't believe very deeply. And I speak to them and ask them to listen carefully to what I have to say about their deep and less deep convictions. I hope they find my arguments compelling and vice versa, but I know that often they don't, and so it goes back and forth. 
So what does one say to the naturalist philosopher who has listened carefully to the arguments and remains a naturalist? I think, what else can you say, but to your deepest commitments be true. Work out your naturalism. See where it goes. I hope you'll see the folly of your ways at some point. But maybe you can teach us something here and there. And what do I say to my fellow Christian? I say the same thing to him or her. Think as a Christian. Speak in dialogue with your fellow philosophers. Be as compelling as you can, and so forth. That's how the academy works, or how it should work, at least in the humanities and social sciences. Something different has to be said about the natural sciences and mathematics. Here's what I call it, dialogic pluralism. You see why, pluralistic and it's dialogic. Now I close with this. The obvious next question is, oh, so here's my formula. I think what I as a Christian do is I engage in my ac academic discipline as a Christian. And the naturalist engages as a naturalist. I close on this obvious question. And what does that actually come to? What does it amount to, to engage in philosophy? Philosophy of art, whatever, political theory, sociology, as a Christian. Uh, the question deserves a book, or at least an essay, but I'm running out of time. So I'm going to just say this. Here's a way of putting it, I think. To engage in your discipline as a Christian is to think about the issues within your discipline with a Christian mind, using mind in St. Paul's sense, having you the mind of Christ. Not, so that's not just head stuff, right? I mean, he means a lot more than that. Engaging in your discipline as a Christian does not consist of saying some Christian words at the beginning of the course and some Christian words at the end of the course. I think it does not consist of developing a theology of the discipline, though I'm not against that. And it certainly does not consist of revising your Christianity so that is compatible with what's um, au courant in your discipline. I also don't think, here I'll touch on some people's toes, I'll step on some people's toes, I suppose. I, I, don't think it, I don't think of it as consisting of integration, which to my mind consists of trying to tie th two things together. Here's what I think it con consists of. I think it consists of thinking about the issues within your discipline with a mentality and sensibility shaped by Christian scripture and the Christian tradition. When doing soci sociology, for example, it consists of employing a Christian understanding of what it is to be a person instead of some reductionist understanding. A Christian mind is a mind shaped by scripture, not little tidbits of scripture, not golden nuggets, but the pattern of Christian thought. And it's a mind shaped by the Christian tradition Too often we American Christians think that in our day we're beginning anew, or we operate on the assumption that nothing really important has preceded us. Let me just say that that's sheer nonsense. You and I are the inheritors of an enormously rich tradition of Christian reflection on politics, on economics, on psychology, you name it, along with an enormously rich tradition of art, of music, of poetry and architecture. We seriously impoverish ourselves if we ignore this. And certainly we seriously impoverish ourselves if we allow secularists to tell the history of the modern, of the modern West and blot out the Christian contribution. Part of your and my responsibility as Christian scholars is to keep the Christian tradition alive and to recover it where it's lost. And also to arrive at the point where you can think with a Christian mind about the issues in your discipline, you have to understand those issues at a deep level. That means being immersed in the discipline and being good at it. You can't do it quickly. Only those who are immersed in the discipline and are good at it can see the fundamental issues. 
If you are thinking with a Christian mind about the issues in your field, you are likely to find yourself critical, at least in the humanities and the social sciences, of some of the work of your colleagues. You're going likely to find some of their assumptions mistake, about human nature mistaken, some of their emphases skewed, and so forth. And so you find yourself engaged in critique. But if at all possible, you go beyond the critique to become constructive, to do it differently and better. But that, let me say emphatically, that's not how it always goes. Often, but not always. Sometimes you'll find yourself agreeing with what's going on in, in some part of your discipline. It's quite okay. For that, you say, praise God. Why should anybody think that everybody disagrees with, uh, everybody disagrees with everything that Christians say? So the goal is not to think differently from everybody else. The goal is to think faithfully. When to say yes and when to say no. And my second point here is, first point with a Christian mind, to engage in your discipline as a Christian requires also speaking with a certain kind of, I'm going to call it voice. That voice will be a voice that exhibits the Christian virtues. It will be a voice of charity. And it will be a voice that, in the words of 1 Peter, honors all human beings. It will sometimes be firm and forthright, but it will never be abusive. There is much abusive talk in the academy as there is in the polity. The Christian scholar will never speak with an abusive voice. And it will also be a voice that can be heard and understood and received by your fellow scholars. A voice that enables you to be a genuine participant in the discipline. When I was teaching at Yale, especially when I was teaching a lecture course on philosophy of religion, um, I allowed, it was a sizable class and we had discussion sections, I allowed students to ask questions in class. Almost always we would be, oh, I don't know, a few weeks into the class, and a student from an evangelical college would raise his hand, it was always a male, never a female, I don't know whether that's significant or not. A male student from an evangelical college would raise his hand and say something like this. But as Jesus says in John 5, verse 16, and by this time I knew some of the students in the class, and the Jewish kids are squirming a little bit. The ones who don't know what they believe are looking at their friends next to them and so forth. Where this sort of, where this rube come from? And I'd have to, each year, take the student aside Say like Jonathan, one of them actually was named Jonathan, but you've got no idea who Jonathan was. Jonathan, you can, say, you can ask approximately that same question, but you've got to learn how to ask in a, in a voice that's appropriate to this Yale philosophy room. And then he'd say, and what's that like? And I'd say, I don't know. I think if you just listen for a few weeks, you will catch on. And almost always they did. So Jonathan was asking his question as he would ask at an evangelical Bible camp. Now, what I've discovered is that evangelicals often interpret the negative response that they get to something they say as hostility to evangelicals, or hostility more generally to Christians. And sometimes it is that. But sometimes it's just a response to the fact that this, this voice, you know what I mean by voice? Just is not <laughs> appropriate to this kind of situation. So that's it. The calling of those of us who are Christian scholars is to think, speak, and act as Christians as we engage with others in the pluralistic dialogue of the modern university. Thank you.